Hi guys, it's Annie McDonald, physio and strength and conditioning coach, and welcome to the Informed Performance Podcast. On today's episode, we have our first ever nutrition-related episode, and we're really lucky to have James Collins, the founder of Intra Performance Group, on the show. Intra Performance Group is an international consultancy focused on providing performance nutrition services within elite sport, entertainment, and business, maintaining a portfolio of Europe's top performers and organizations. James has a wealth of knowledge and experience in a variety of sectors and different sports and provides excellent clarity in today's conversation about how nutrition is provided in elite sport currently, where it's heading, and how optimal nutrition service provision should function. This episode of the Informed Performance Podcast has been sponsored by Vol Performance, makers of the Force Frame. Used by health and performance professionals for assessing and improving performance and rehabilitation, the Force Frame is a powerful solution for quickly and accurately testing isometric strength and imbalances. In addition to testing athletes, the Force Frame is also used to maintain and improve strength, offering over 130 isometric training protocols. As a portable and easy to use system, the Force Frame is designed to ensure every measurement can be accurately and reliably measured time after time again. To learn more about the Force Frame, visit our sponsor, volperformance.com. Inform Performance is a proud partner of Humac Norm by CSMI. Are you using your Cybex, Biodex, or Humac Isokinetic system to its fullest potential? Most machines are used 90% for training and 10% for testing. If this is not you, check out the free online course Isokinetics 101 for the classroom by CSMI. In 90 minutes, you will learn how isokinetic machines are used in the clinic for testing and to improve range of motion, stability, control, and strength. If you need CEUs, earn eight CEUs by signing up and completing our full online course, Isokinetics 101 Online. This course is approved for PTs, PTAs, and ATCs. To find out more, visit humacnorm.com and head to resources. Inform Performance is proud to partner with Sportscientia, an emerging precision technology that harnesses the power of AI and machine learning to seamlessly capture gait analysis in real-world conditions and provide 3D depictions of the foot during both swing and stance phases of the gait cycle. This enables practitioners to further break down analysis of athletes running and moving in multidirectional movements, their forces, their max speeds, distances, steps, and more. To get more information, head to their website, sportscientia.com. You're listening to the Informed Performance Podcast with me, Annie McDonald, and here is today's episode with James Collins. James, welcome to the show. It's uh, it's great to have you on. Thanks for having me on, Andy. I appreciate it's taken a little while to get it together, but thanks for your patience. We obviously met, it must have been a few years ago now, in London with Ben Ashworth over a coffee. So um, it's been a long-awaited episode, but it's good good we can make it happen. Um, would just to kind of kick us off, would you be able to, uh, you know, I know your background, but could you tell our listeners what your background is, just in case it's their their first encounter of you? Yeah, absolutely, Andy. Yeah, so my background is working as a sports nutritionist, and I started working with the EIS, well, now known as the UK Sports Institute, prior to the Beijing 2008 Olympic Games. So the first sport I worked with was track and field. You really enjoyed my time there. Uh, From there, uh, I spent seven seasons as head of nutrition services at Arsenal Football Club and also along the way worked as a consultant with England football and also France football national teams as well. And I currently am managing director of Intra Performance Group and we're a consultancy providing nutrition nutrition solutions across two key strands really. The first is strategic services to national associations, clubs and high growth businesses But we also have a portfolio of individual players and individual athletes we look after. Football side, uh, footballers from the top five European leagues, but also golfers and musicians from the US as well. What what was your kind of journey to get through to that point? Obviously, that's, a, 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 I guess, a bit of a highlight reel there. But what what was the journey like for you to get to where you are now from, I guess, your like initial beginnings in, in nutrition? Yeah, really interesting, Andy. So yeah, I completed my my postgrad at Loughborough University, and that was in sports nutrition. And as I look back, this was around 2005, 2006. And I was incredibly fortunate at the time, because in this country, UK sport were running a fast track practitioner program. And essentially, we had different disciplines. So nutrition, physiology, strength and conditioning, medical, there were places to fast track practitioners within a year's program. So 
I was quite fortunate I got onto that program and got some really deep exposure at the coalface with track and field straight away. Yeah, I started, I really remember distinctly that first year really well. I was in Birmingham, uh, based at Alexander Stadium. I don't know if you've been there. Um, Not yet. And uh, yeah, that, that was where my journey started there. And as we might come on to today, I was you know quite fortunate as well with the practitioners I worked with early on. It gave me a really good grounding. Uh, not just in nutrition, but I think a really good understanding in medical and performance sciences as well. And most importantly, those practitioner skills. And then what kind of gave birth to the the company? What sort of triggered the move from, I, I guess, being in teams, NGBs, and then sort of progressing to having your own uh, your own shop, if we call it that? Yeah, I, I think for me, Andy, I always had the ambition of having seen nutrition services in-house I've always really enjoyed the variety um, and I've always really enjoyed the, um, the idea of putting my own team together. So I think probably like all of us, we have a real direction and a real idea of how services should work. And I think for myself, I was always really keen to build my nutrition team with different elements to have some research and development, to have some practitioners, to have some commercial support and to create a business where we're working across different strands. I mean, fundamentally my work has always been in sport but for us at the moment probably some of our most interesting projects are on the business side we work with a couple of high growth businesses and also as part of our portfolio as well we work with musicians and I think for me um, I think the older I get I think probably the more performance uh, or sorry industry agnostic I've become Um, I really enjoy just working on great projects with progressive people and whether that brief comes from you know a a musician music label or a sports uh I think me and my team as well, we find that really exciting. So I think in answer to your question, it's probably the variety uh, which really drove me to set up Intro. Yeah. We've had a few guests on the show where I guess myself and them have kind of uh, reminisced on like our early beginnings in strength and conditioning and how maybe that industry's changed over time. But for, for nutrition, how, how has that changed, at, at least in your sort of tenure as working in that space? What, what did it look like when you entered as a service versus maybe what does kind of modern nutrition look like now in sport? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, Andy. And I think probably to start with, the first thing that I would say that we need to recognize is nutrition is a, quite a young discipline in relation to other disciplines. So for example, in relation to medical, physiotherapy, strength and conditioning, there's probably a lot of similarities with nutrition and psychology within professional sport, definitely in terms of the full-time equivalents uh, across the world. I mean, I guess thinking back for me, and I've already referenced this once before, but thinking back to the EIS days in 2006, I remember before I joined the fast track program, uh, you know, coming out of my MSc, there was only probably a handful of full-time sports nutritionists working in the UK and actually to think about that now and reflect on it, you know, I find it quite incredible. I actually had a chat to a couple of my colleagues recently and said, you know, do you remember back then what the industry looked like? So it was really quite small. And I think it's taken a long time for nutrition to be understood and accepted. And I think especially within football, which I'll probably reference most of mine and our work from today. Um, you know, I think probably thinking back to the early days then reminiscing, um, you know, 15 years ago, I think the conversation was very different, especially in my first roles within team sports. I think actually the conversation and nutrition was seen slightly more negatively. And what I mean by that is a lot of the performance questions posed by athletes and posed by coaches were around body fat and weight. And you were told to go and see the nutritionist in a slightly negative way if you needed to lose weight. And it was almost seen as the nutritionist would be telling the chefs what they couldn't prepare. So it took a while, I think, to change that approach. You know, actually comparing that to athletics, which was my first sport, I think we were probably more progressive at the time early on. And I think that was probably due to having quite a strong group of practitioners there at the time. I mean, some of the guests you were, I think, had on the show already, you know, I worked very closely in the same office. We had Raf Brandon, we had James Moore, uh, Alex Wolf, Mark Young and Paul Dykstra. So there was a really good performance team there. And I think personally, that helped me to embed my nutrition service within athletics. Um, but I think probably comparing that to football, I remember first joining Arsenal and I think probably the key thing on my mind at that point was really demonstrating to each player the effect that nutrition could have on their performance. And I think the easiest win at that time was to affect their energy levels on match day, to show them that, look, what you eat on match day can fundamentally improve how you feel and your physical capacity during a match. And I think 
once we had that hook early on with the players, it was really easy then to build a relationship and build the service out into the club. But I think it really did then start with the players to you know get that buy-in early on. I think at the time that was really important. And I guess you know the second part of that, Andy, really is fast forwarding to where we are today. And you know, as we all know, nutrition has increased rapidly. You know, the provision is, of nutrition has increased dramatically at the top professional sports, both in Europe and in the US. We now have got more practitioners uh, within teams and the better quality of chefs providing food service as well within those teams. And I think nutrition is generally better understood. But probably an important point to note is, you know, maybe with some of your listeners, we're working at top teams in the US and in Europe. The next level down, uh, down in the pyramid, the nutrition provision isn't as strong. It's still very underdeveloped in comparison to these other disciplines. Um, I think part of the reason why nutrition now has got better engagement from sporting directors, from coaches, is that previously they've experienced the service as athletes. You know, we've worked with a few sports that the, the sporting director has experienced it as an athlete and really knows how to use the service and knows what performance questions to ask. You know, for example, they'll know that a key amount of time should be focused on strategies for player preparation or athlete recovery, um, as opposed to focusing maybe on these more you know, ancient being the wrong word, but, uh, you know, body composition and body fats, you know, where the focus maybe was early on. So I think in general, Andy, there's a really nice opportunity now for, for practitioners to really individualize nutrition strategies uh, with athletes, depending on physical training loads, depending on match demands. And, you know, and also the uh, the athlete goals as well. You know, you mentioned athlete goals at the end there. Have you noticed that the the demands from the players themselves have changed in terms of how they engage you for nutrition now? Yes, yeah, for sure. And I think this is probably reflective of wider society as well, right, Andy? And I think it's really important that, you know, the sport is almost a microcosm, isn't it, of, of wider society. I think what we're seeing now is players being more direct and have more understanding about what they want from a nutrition service. Um, we're definitely dealing with more empowered players and more empowered athletes now. And this probably goes into a running theme, perhaps we might discuss later on, that, you know, and I think... In terms of players, players now are more in tune with their own data. They're more across their own data and they're asking the right questions of a nutrition service. So for us to work with empowered athletes and empowered players is really important. And that's, you've given us an absolute wealth of context there. What's the absolute kind of current state, maybe with football or with other sports? Where are we now with um, provision? So I guess the lie of the land, I guess from my perspective, Andy, I'm probably best placed to talk about football and, and where nutrition is across the industry there. And what I'll do is I can reference uh, the UEFA Nutrition Consensus, which I've worked on recently, which is a three-year project which I led with Alan McCall, who is Head of Research and Innovation at Arsenal Football Club. And this came about from some of our early scoping with UEFA. And we looked at the different services across Europe and we found that the standard of nutrition delivery across national federations and clubs differed greatly. So our objective really was to create some best practice scientific guidelines for use right across the game. The first thing we noticed straight away when we went into this project, Andy, was that the last consensus was back in 2006, which FIFA ran. So we had, you know, over 12 years of no consensus within football, which seems crazy. Um, the rationale for us was really important at the time. We had lots of questions we felt that we needed to answer. And I think the first one was that over this period of time, the research has rapidly evolved and so much so that the practitioners might not be able to keep up. So we've got greater depth and research and also breadth of topics which are contained under nutrition. The second key rationale for us is that the physiological demand of the game had increased greater high speed loading within football. So we needed to be able to fuel players effectively to cope with those, those demands and also recover effectively. I think the next big question for us, and it's a big one, we, we might not cover it in detail today, but it's about supplement, supplement use. You know, we know that supplement use has increased across sport, but especially within football as well. But there's a lack of conse uh, consensus on efficacy and safety of supplements. And I think finally, we see more and more publications on rehabilitation and return to play, but how should nutrition fit into that pathway? Um, so the actual publication itself, we had a huge theme on training nutrition and a big theme on matching nutrition as well. But we also had different themes on immunity, travel, extreme environments. And this covers the junior player, the female player, and also the male player too. And 
it was a bit of a process, <laughs> if I'm honest, Andy, looking back at it. Um, we had a team of 31 experts, and we were really looking to have a blend of applied scientists who had genuine domain expertise in one area, but we also wanted practitioners who were working at the coalface to help answer these performance questions. Really key to us as well that we had a number of different cultures represented. So on the final paper, we had nine different countries across four continents uh, for this BGSM publication. I think probably most important for us, Andy, and probably most noteworthy was we had two editorials that we wanted to bring in alongside the scientists. Now, the first thing for us is with our conversation with UEFA, we felt really strongly that we wanted these to be really integrated guidelines to impact the game. So we wanted to bring in a coach who was quite iconic and recognized for their work in nutrition. And for us, there was only really one person. You know, Arsene Wenger had been promoting nutrition since his work with AS Monaco in the 1980s. And we asked him to get involved and if he'd like to contribute an editorial and it's a brilliant editorial and I won't uh, ruin it for the people who haven't read it but the first paragraph really sticks in my mind one of the things he says right from the off is that we often hear from the scientific community but too often it's the voices of coaches that aren't heard when they could offer a valuable insight and I think that's a really powerful message so we wanted our guidelines to be coach-led so that's a really nice editorial uh, for, for people to have a look at there and the other one was looking from the medical background so we had uh, Professor Tim Meyer who's head of the UEFA research committee and medical committee and also the German national team doctor who gave his perspective on nutrition from the multidisciplinary team and he's got some really clear and insightful th thoughts on this um, the big thing I would say Andy for, is, is this is all free of charge so um, for the publication, it's from BGSM and it's free to access online. When you um, when you move the the conversation forwards in the way that you have with that work, and I guess give clarity and consistency in the process, what what do you do next? It's obviously a, it's a huge door to open, and I'm sure that's triggered lots of question, questions and conversations with clubs. But um, is it a kind of standalone project, or is it the start of something that you'll you'll continue or do? Um, you know, numerous editions of, or, you know, how does it kind of, where do you go next with it? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, we, we've got lots of threads that we're really interested with Andy. Um, I think first of all, like for me and for, you know, for all of us involved in the group, for Alan also, this is all about impact. So I think what we have is we now have a really nice scientific piece, scientific guidelines, but I think with nutrition in general, it's the implementation that makes the difference. And I think how we embed this into coaching guidelines, I think will be really important uh, to make it truly interdisciplinary. I think that's really interesting for us. And there's also different subtopics which have fallen out of the consensus. For us, we're con you know, currently working on another piece on sustainability and the fact that within elite football, at the moment we've got nutrition and we've got performance over one side, but sustainability is often over the other side of the conversation. And we know that in general, you know, the food system makes up approximately 26% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. So for us, uh, we're starting some commentary and conversation around how can we start to build good protocols around nutrition and sustainability within football? And what should these look like? That's another really interesting area for us. Um, and there's, you know, others besides that as well, Andy. You know, I guess in answer to your question, um, We've got the guidelines which we'll continue to update and then we're going to kind of continue to see which areas do the footballing community want for impact as well because I think one of the things I learned from the process is we, we went in with a really strong idea about what the guidelines would look like and I remember going to our first UEFA meeting and some of the feedback I got was actually, well, James, at national team level, we're really struggling on the buffet. You know, there's lots of cross-contamination happening. Are you going to mention this in your guidelines? And I remember thinking at the time, Actually, no, we haven't got a section on that. We had a really strong section under immunity and immunonutrition, really strong scientifically. But some of these practical uh, questions coming back from UEFA and from practitioners on the ground really helped us to shape uh, the next drafts and the final version of this manuscript. So I think the other really important thing for us is that um, we're responding to questions on the ground from practitioners and from clubs, and we are hopefully continue to build different bits of work. It might be a publication, might, it might be multimedia, but I think listening to the questions on the ground and then forming solutions from there is really important. I guess, you know, given the context we've spoken about and, and especially given the context that you, you've, you, you just mentioned, you kind of receive in the process of making that kind of, uh, um, you know, guide, I guess, for people, what, what do you think kind of progressive nutrition services should look like given that, you know, massive context? 
Wow, it's, it's a really good question, Andy. Um, I think there's a few ways that we could go at this. You know, in terms of, of a progressive nutrition service, I think firstly, if we take the multidisciplinary team, I think the first thing nutrition has to be is integrated. So nutrition services need to be fully integrated within the multidisciplinary team. So embedded and that you have staff working within that team. I think gone are the days really that we'll see consultants, you know, dipping in and out of that team because that will really limit effectiveness. So I think having integrated services are probably point number one. And I think that flows quite nicely in the way that progressive services should work. And that's in an interdisciplinary way, you know, working closely with other team members to co-create an overall performance plan. I think for nutrition, the most obvious relationships are with S&C, you know, working closely with S&C to understand the loading, to understand the plans for nutrition to dovetail its periodization around the training programs as well. But the same process really happens, I think, in our experience with physiotherapy too, you know, taking a player along that return to play pathway as well. Um, so I think that interdisciplinary nature is crucial. And I think probably that filters down quite nicely as well into a shared process. So I think both practitioners or all of the team following a performance backwards approach where we understand the determinants of performance, we understand the physiological demands, and then we also understand the demands of training and the training uh, objectives, which will enable us to personalize and to periodize nutrition effectively. You know, for example, making sure that we're optimizing physical capacity uh, in the matches, especially in the second half of matches. Um, Andy, that probably all sounds quite neat, doesn't it? But I think my, in my experience, it's often really quite messy. And I think that some of the best interdisciplinary work really is quite messy because we work obviously within sport and the context changes quite quickly. So I think for me, the, the depth of relationships is really important and the communication. Uh, but I think also as well, honesty. And, you know, I read a book recently by Ray Dalio, the, the investor on principles, and he talks a lot about uh, radical transparency and radical honesty. And I think that's something that we really try and use a lot within Intra as well. And I think the best work that we've tended to do is when we're holding an, another person accountable and they're holding us accountable. This might be a strength and conditioning coach. This might be a doctor. This might be the athlete. But I think that's really important too. But a couple of key areas that this might distill into a little bit more then is obviously there we've mentioned the MDT. We haven't mentioned the coach. You know, it's crucial that obviously a lot of services within sport are coach led. And, you know, I really see this as it being a two-way relationship between nutritionist and coach. And it's really important that one supports the other. I think initially it's about the nutritionist spending time with the coach to understand their performance direction. And it might be the nutritionist's job really to understand that direction and help distill it and help co-create the ethos with the coach of what nutrition should look like and what lifestyle should look like with the players. And then potentially to go back to the coach and look at the target areas they might want to focus on within this group of players. Again, the nutritionist and coach really co-creating these solutions as well. But having that really close relationship, I think, is really important. It obviously goes without saying the biggest impact I've seen within sports is where you've got the coach absolutely living and breathing nutrition. So they're involved in group presentations. They might sit in in a consultation, but they're displaying with how they eat in the restaurant and their attitude to nutrition. That, without doubt, being you know an, an early and more developing service is so crucial for nutrition within professional sport. I think final point, Andy, probably just to finish this off, is the players themselves, right? And I think it's really important how we engage and set up our service with the players. I'm a huge believer in the players understanding that nutrition is an iterative process, first of all. So it's a two-way process that we will give them strategies and ask them to test and work with them to refine those strategies. And I think it's really important for them to understand it's an active process at the start, just like any coaching process. I think gone are the days when nutrition is perceived to just be handing over a static plan or a static strategy. And I think it's really important we you know, hit that from the start and that everyone understands the relationship there. And probably going back to a further point you mentioned earlier on, Andy, was you know, we really need to work in a way to empower players. And we spend a lot of time coaching them so that they have different strategies or plans depending on the different scenarios in their week. So for example, what does a lower loading training day look like? What does a match day look like? What does a recovery day look like? Maybe travel as well. So they have all of these different scenarios uh, planned out as well. But as you mentioned earlier on, it's really important we have empowered players to ask the right questions. And I think an a progressive service is set up in a way which enables players to be empowered. And 
I think we have a constant consideration here with nutrition because often now we have a lot of training grounds or training centers, which look wonderful, right? Wonderful restaurants. We've got recovery centers. But I think it's really tempting for nutrition as well as wider performance for, to want to do everything for the players. And for us, it's really important that players take ownership for their strategies. So, for example, for us personally, players need to be able to plate up their food to understand what fueling they need on certain days. Likewise, they need, they need to understand their supplementation and how their supplementation might change on different days. Because when it's done at a club on one day, that might be absolutely fine. A lot of the players that we might work with in Europe, 60 or 70 percent of the squad might be international players playing at different countries without the same nutrition provision. So they need to be able to take ownership for this in a different scenario. So I think for us, I think it's really important we set up ways to stress test players' competencies with nutrition, to try and get and demonstrate evidence that they're learning and they're progressing with their competencies too. Just a quick break in the conversation with James. And in Form Performance, you may have noticed that we're launching more webinars and courses online from some of the expert guests that we're lucky to record episodes with. If you head to informperformance.com and click on education, you can see our growing webinar and course offering. One upcoming example is Claire Robertson, who we just had on the show, who's releasing a course with us called Managing Patella for Moral Pain for Athletes. We'll be releasing regular offers and new courses, so keep an eye on our education page so you don't miss out. I've got, I've got a bit of a curveball question, if you don't mind, mate. Um, what, you know, when, when I trained as a physio or when you trained as a nutritionist or when someone trains as a sports scientist or coach, um, your foundation training obviously involves a lot of the kind of scientific material. And then you get into maybe a sports environment and behavior change becomes a much bigger part of the role or skill set that you have to develop. Do you, do you find yourself having to kind of periodize what you change nutritionally with certain players over time in, in the sense of, you know, do you have to kind of go slowly with certain players and pick off the low hanging fruits of the, the immediate changes they should make? Cause obviously there'll be players that you might have encountered that might have low nutrition literacy, if we call it that, and you probably can't change everything at once. I'm just wondering how you kind of strategize their changes or their nutrition change over time. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, Andy, as well. You know, I think for me personally, I think a lot of the early work that I used to do with athletes in this setting was actually working very closely with a psychologist. So, for example, either at the EIS or Arsenal or in other sporting settings, to work really closely with a psychologist to understand the different player and how they tend to work and how they like to receive information as well. So to get a good understanding on them, to then see about how we might start to structure a program of support for that athlete. But you're absolutely right. You know, different athletes will have to really shape the approach for. And I'm just thinking of a few off the top of my head now that we manage privately. We've got one particular player that for weekly touch points, we can almost work through a syllabus of support for them. Um, we have a really good setup with them. There's lots of feedback coming through. We're evidencing competencies and it's really clear. So that's great. On the other hand, you know, we have another player that we're looking after at the moment and who has lower nutrition literacy and behavior change, not just with nutrition, but with strength and conditioning and different elements of performance is slower. So we're really having to drip feed uh, the work through and also look at how the player likes to receive information as well. Some of the players that we have like to receive more written information. Others would prefer to be almost coached verbally uh, through the nutrition uh, competencies as well. So I think we're still learning, if I'm really honest, Andy, as well. I think where possible, you know, we try and lean on expertise and behavior change, uh, you know, to understand what makes the athletes tick and how we can apply our discipline. But I don't know what you think. You know, my thought is we still have a huge amount to learn in this behavior change space. And this just isn't working with athletes. This is actually how we set up the performance environment for them as well. You know, so how the physical environment should look and how we want the players to interact with them. Um, yeah, what's your thoughts to that, Andy? Yeah, just what you're saying there, I'm thinking, you know, I think with physio or with S&C, there's, there's clearly behavior change and habits and learning that you want to install in players. But um, from what you're saying, it sounds like I think with nutrition, that's a much bigger part than maybe it is with, with say, the gym. Like if you've got an athlete in the gym with you, to some extent, you're supervising their time with them. And yes, you want to still install accountability and, and, and teach with them. But I think it, it sounds like nutrition is much more of a, a behavior aspect because there's a lot of time they obviously spend away from you. 
So you want to be able to empower their decisions and uh, thought process. So, you know, there might be someone, there might be a physio and S&T coach uh, screaming at their headphones right now as I say that, but um, it just sounds like what you have to do demands a lot more um, strategy on um, like their learning process, I guess, for, for behavior. Yeah, quite, quite possibly. And I couldn't speak for the other disciplines, Andy, but I think with nutrition as well, I think one of the things that we're really trying to look at in more detail as well is, you know, what does this time look like that they're away from the training environment, right? So they might be spending, let's say they spend six hours within the training center. We know that the bulk of the meals might be eaten away from the center as well, you know. So we're, we're really keen to understand relationships with significant others. We're really keen to understand drivers at home with how they eat and also potential barriers as well. And I think often, and I will, I've definitely made this mistake earlier in my career that, you know, often with nutrition, uh, players will know what to do. You know, they've received basics of advice. They have a plan. But the difference between knowing what to do and the execution is often absolutely massive. So for us, we're really having to really try and understand how can we close that gap. And that's just when the players are obviously in the country. You know, when we have players that will travel on international duty or to World Cups or to major championships or to, you know, in golf traveling around the, the country most weeks. Uh, it's really important we understand as much as possible and as deeply as possible that player's lifestyle. And probably as I was talking about earlier on, this word honesty and radical honesty, that's often what we need from our clients as well. It's, it's really no good them telling us that they're actioning different parts of advice if the data is suggesting otherwise or that it's actually not happening. We need to set up a relationship where we have this honesty and this trust with players, first of all, or with different athletes too. Following on from that, how does the, the food service play a part in this and, and what does that look like? Yeah, good question, Andy. It's got a huge part to play, right? Um, the need has really grown here. So I think we've seen that you know, now from having a chef at the training ground to supporting you know, match day or game day travel uh, to supporting personal chefs with the athletes themselves. I think in many places across Europe, for sure, we've seen that a lot of clubs have had to overhaul and modernize what they're doing. I think probably 10, 15 years ago, this started with a cook or someone that didn't have performance expertise rather than having a performance focus to food. So that's had to really modernize. I think one of the biggest challenges, Andy, if I'm honest, is it is really difficult in the UK and Europe at the moment to find chefs with the right skill set. And again, this is a problem of wider society as well. We know the hospitality industry is having huge problems at the moment. We've got Michelin starred restaurants who are struggling to find the right caliber of chef. So that's one challenge. Um, I think it's really important with the food service that this is really well thought out and the right expertise is involved here because... I've seen numerous examples with clubs where organizations have signed long-term contracts with caterers, and that really limits the progress about how the food can be prepared within the training ground. Another example might be, you know, we've got a new training ground developed and the restaurant area looks lovely. We've got recovery areas, recovery bars. They look wonderful, brilliantly designed, but it doesn't really reflect the real ethos of the organization all the behaviors that we're trying to promote within the players uh, as well. So I think it's really important the right expertise is involved with that initially to help frame the right strategy to build out from as well. It's also really important to note, you know, I think in Europe that the cultural diversity within teams is huge and food plays a really important part within this. I mean, for example, the Premier League at the moment is over 60% 60 of expatriate players and this plays a vital role with it when integrating new signings into clubs as well from different countries. So I think food has a really important role on that side of things uh, too. You mentioned a couple kind of along the way, but is there any like key challenges or problem sounds a bit harsh, but any challenges you've had um, in certain settings and then maybe solutions that you found effective along the way? And obviously, cherry pick examples here. Yeah, I think so. Just like every discipline, nutrition has its challenges, right? And I'm not sure we have, or definitely I have all the solutions yet as well, for sure. Um, I think most of the challenges can be born out of the rapid growth of the discipline as well, Andy. So I think probably the first one that springs to mind for me is the breadth of the role with nutrition. And I think it's really important to recognize the breadth of the service. So nutrition 
sits within the multidisciplinary team, as we mentioned earlier on. So it, it can work very closely with injured athletes, right along that pathway, right the way through to optimizing the performance or helping to optimize the performance of the fully fit athletes. But one of the key roles as well is actually outside of the multidisciplinary team. And that's working with different chefs to set up the food service. And I think one of the big challenges we have as a discipline is there's no clear best practice about what the optimal model is. And I think that's really important for us to recognize because I'm working through this with a number of organizations at the moment, and it really depends on the organizational culture. There is no one size fits all. And I think it's really important to really understand that culture and how we co-create the best model for them. Um, I think aligned to that, if, you know, if I'm really honest, Andy, as well, is that I think there's a small piece in here about recognizing nutrition and how it's managed. And I think that more often than not within sport, we see uh, heads of performance from a physio and a strength and conditioning background and not a nutrition background. That's most common. So there's perhaps a piece in here, I think, to be mindful that when we're setting up a nutrition service and optimally what we want the service to look like, there might be gaps uh, in the knowledge here that we need to try and fill. So it might be about bringing someone in for some uh, strategic support early on. And that could be helpful just to ensure that the service grows and the service doesn't become limited in that way. So I think that's one challenge straight away. Kind of spills slightly into another challenge, which you know just springs to mind for me, and that's technical support. And something that we've witnessed for our work with UEFA across European football is that a lot of practitioners are working without technical support, and this can lead to working in silo. And we're seeing, especially with junior practitioners, they can be vulnerable to this need to always be innovating. And this can result often with increasing the amount of supplementation that's going to a team. So, you know, almost trying to deliver that magic bullet when you, there's, there's a need or a pressure to innovate. When actually the best intervention is to stand still, to do nothing, and let the player or the athlete focus on another part of their performance plan. And I think it's really important that we have technical support of staff right across the organization. I think that's firstly to ensure continuity of service from, let's say, women's programs, men's academy loans. That's obviously extremely important. But I think it's also to ensure that the practitioners themselves have professional development each year. They're continuing to develop each year. Their professional competencies are continuing to develop and they're not becoming stale because another challenge that we're witnessing here in Europe is quite a big amount of churn with practitioners leaving roles. So I think it's it's really important within organization that there's a pathway for them. They can see growth as a practitioner and they're continuing to enjoy their role as well. You make, you make a really interesting point there. And I was actually, I was listening to another podcast the other day that featured um, Ben Rosenblatt, who I'm sure you'll know from Six Degrees of Separation and on the episode I was listening to, he mentioned the sort of value of um, educating the athletes that you or empowering the athletes that you're with enough that you can actually spend from a coaching perspective, at least a lot of time observing. But I think it probably applies to the other disciplines as well, where I guess, you know, it's quite, I can see why a junior practitioner wants to be in action mode all the time, because there's a certain level of newness and maybe insecurity to the sport setting that they're in or contracts or you know whatever the the politics is but I think it if you're comfortable and your service is running I, I guess as you hope and intended you can actually sit still for a minute and actually observe it, it's interesting that you said that just just timing wise upon what I listened to recently yeah I totally agree with that and I know Ben very well we work very closely together and um, and what I would say, Andy, is probably a lot of the themes that we're discussing here today, you know, I mentioned some of the practitioners early on, you know, progressive services have a similar process, right? Whether this is nutrition, whether this is S&C, whether this is medical, whether this is physiotherapy, whether it's psychology. I think we're all following similar uh, processes that we've developed as practitioners, but we're just, we have our technical nuance within that. So I think we, you know, we should have lots of crossover with how we see the world. And I think it's actually really important as well that, Definitely for nutrition, the best quality work is done when you're working in an interdisciplinary way. So I think having shared practice or shared objectives and a shared process with other practitioners is so important too. You know, we've covered a lot today and uh, there's a million silos we could go off, uh, not silos, there's a million tangents we could go off into in this conversation. Um, to kind of close up, what do you think are the, the maybe the future directions of nutrition and um, and some service provision? I know you've probably um, flirted with that topic already today, but 
maybe we can get into that to finish up. Yeah, to- yeah, totally, Andy. Um, I have a quite a strong view on a few of these points. Um, some of the listeners may agree or disagree with these, but from my experience, uh, so I believe that the future of a lot of nutrition services is enabling nutrition services to really drive return on investment. So I really believe we're going to see greater involvement, involvement from nutrition in commercial and revenue generating projects within organizations. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at most headline sports, most top tier sports around the world, they have a top tier nutrition sponsor. So that's always going to be a commercial decision each year. I think alongside from that, that's something that's well known. The next step down is we're seeing more and more clubs now have more innovation hubs and more incubators to bring on new projects. So, for example, there are different clubs that might be looking at products in a nutrition sphere or a well-being sphere to actually generate income for the club. And I believe that nutrition has a really important role in the due diligence for a lot of these projects. So what I see is nutrition actually, even though it would exist within a multidisciplinary team, there's a strong commercial element here that the clubs and organizations can lean on within nutrition. And I think it then starts to change the conversation with how we view nutrition, because if it's an income generative, we're not then having the conversation or a header or a director of performance is having the conversation of saying, OK, well, what do we have left in the budget after X services for nutrition? So I think it will then change the conversation and enable really organizations to get the full amount of value from a nutrition service, both in servicing its talent, in building the culture, but also supporting uh, commercial um, commercial projects, too. So. That's probably the the biggest headline feature, I think, for me, Andy. And I think I mentioned as well sustainability, this being a really important area. And I think probably the thing I didn't mention at the time is now that obviously it's really important that sports grow their culture around sustainability. But I think also aligned to that, we've got younger athletes coming through now that will really demand that. And I think that's absolutely right. And I think that a lot of the athletes that we work with, and I remember a few that I've worked with as well, are demanding change in this area of sustainability. And they're going to really drive clubs to make this change, uh, whether essentially clubs will like to or not. So players are demanding more now. Fans are demanding more and society is demanding more. So there's going to be a really important time now for sports organizations to really align performance and sustainability to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and make sure it's not lip service as well. So I'm quite excited about that. As I mentioned, we have a publication coming out. um, So I'll let you know uh, when that's out as well on that. And that's following on from UEFA. I think the final point, Andy, for me, the final thing I'm thinking about is, um, is technology, right? So we can't talk about the future and not mention technology. It's almost a given, isn't it, at this stage? And I'll probably avoid going down a rabbit hole here about specific innovations. Uh, For sure, there are some areas that we're monitoring closely. I think I'm also really interested in some of the newer early stage concepts which haven't scaled yet. And I think we're seeing a few examples here about technology which provides more contextual information on our athletes, which is non-invasive and what they're doing over 24 hours. And I think we're going to see a lot more of these grow, especially Uh, well, especially solutions which are uh, AI-based as well over the next few years. So I'm I'm really interested in that space as well. And I think finally, probably to wrap up, I think as we've mentioned a few times, you know, externally, we're going to see more and more now of uh, players accessing performance support within their own multidisciplinary teams. I think that's really interesting. And I think the relationship and how they work with clubs, I think will be really interesting too. And I think the two can coexist really well. And that's what we're seeing on the ground that our work with organizations and with individuals can coexist and all about communication and making sure that people are on the same page with that. But, you know, I think in general, um, I think if some of these more strategic changes are executed with nutrition, I think we can start to see more impact and more return on investment for an organization. And yeah, I'm really excited by it. No, brilliant. And where can people find you? Where's the best place for people to follow you online? You obviously mentioned your UEFA work, but where, where can people kind of track you on um, uh, social media, obviously? Oh, okay. Yeah, I- I'm pretty slow on social media, Andy, but my, my Twitter handle is uh, James Collins PN. Uh, it's the same for Instagram too. And our company website, I'm actually having to think about all of these, is intraperformancegroup.com. So that would be the place to find out more information about Intra and what we do. 
Perfect. Well, mate, thank you very much. It's it's um you've been our first uh, nutritional guest, which is way overdue at 120 something episodes at this point. So um, fascinating for me to listen, and I'm sure that our regular listeners will, will really appreciate this one as well. Oh, it's my pleasure, Andy. And you know, again, thanks for having me on.